Welcome back to another Film Geek video. Today I am counting down all of the movies I saw in the month of September. Now September I ended up seeing a lot more movies on the old streaming services than I was expecting. I didn't make it out to the theaters as much as I was hoping to and a lot of that had to do with that damn broken toe. In all honesty there was a lot of days I came home from a good day at work at the old museum and my foot was just throbbing and I honestly did not feel like going out to the old movie theaters. So I did take in a lot of movies on streaming services this month, but I'm going to try to keep doing that moving forward because I, I liked a lot of what I saw this month. So we're going to dive into that. Now this is all 100% my personal opinion. None of these movies ranked today are based off of any Rotten Tomato or anything like that. This is just my personal opinion. I saw 10 new movies Movies, some in theaters, some on streaming services in the month of September, and I'm going to rank them from my favorite to least favorite film I saw this month. So it's enough of me sitting here yammering on because we have 10 movies to talk about, so we need to get over to that good old series of tubes we call the internet and rank the September movies of 2024. Welcome back, everybody, even though you guys weren't gone that awful long, but welcome to the Internet, and more importantly, welcome to the rankings of September 2024. So let's get this started, okay, with my favorite movie of the month, and I'm not going to beat around the bush on this one because it was uh, definitely the substance. We're going to put that right up here at number one. One, Okay, The Substance, starring Demi Moore and Dennis Quaid. This film was ridiculously good, guys. I enjoyed this movie so much. Just after I left the theater, the more I thought about this film, the more it got under my skin, and the more I realized that this might be, so far, this might be the best horror film I have seen in 2024. The performances were amazing. The the special effects, the practical special effects in this film were unnerving, disgusting, and beautiful all at the same time. This film had such a cool story. It was not something that we haven't seen before, but the way that the story is told made it seem extremely fresh and new. So this is the movie, of course, starring Demi Moore and Dennis Quaid that tells the story of an aging actress who decides to take something called the substance that allows her to split into a younger self and then during a process she's able to like transfer her mind soul whatever you want to say into the younger form older form and so on and so forth and there's very simple rules that have to be followed and all this other stuff I mean this film is just an absolute horror masterpiece and if you are someone who's just a fan of horror this is a film. I mean, this is definitely a film you need to watch. If you can take gore, I say go ahead and watch this movie also, even if you're not a horror fan, because it's just an extremely well-made all-around film with great acting. There's also something I didn't mean in my review also. Oh, I forgot to mention. All the movies I'm talking about today, I have done full reviews on, so if I don't get into super detail on some of these, you can always go back on my channel and check out my reviews. Now, anyways, one of the things in my review of this film that I didn't cover was the amazing sound design in this film. It really adds to the horror of this movie. And this is another film that made me love seeing horror in theaters again because I, I'm one of those people that I love watching horror movies with other people. It feels like we're going on this little journey of fear together. And this movie was so much fun to see in a theater with others. Like I, the experience I had, there was a scene with Dennis Quaid and I didn't talk about this and this is where the sound design comes in. Dennis Quaid just eating shrimp or prawns or whatever you want to call them, little freaking ocean insects anyways he's sucking these things down and i do mean sucking these things down and for me man nothing is grosser than those sounds of like a person chewing and eating and smacking their lips and like sticking their fingers in their mouth and everything and i think that scene with dennis quaid in the movie 
grossed me out more than any freaking body horror that happened for the rest of the film. And it was so amazingly shot, so just everything put together so well in that scene. It made just the freaking task of eating shrimp feel just like the most disgusting thing in the entire world. And I haven't seen a horror movie that does something like that to you in a long freaking time. And so that's why the substance finds itself at number one. So moving on to number two, and I'm going to go with... Yeah, I'm gonna kind of lighten the mood right now, okay? Because I could go with another horror movie, but I, I think I'm gonna go to this one right here. The Wild Robot. Whoop, 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 whoop. He didn't quite catch. There we go. Come on, Wild Robot. There we are. The Wild Robot finds itself at number two. Now, A Wild Robot is the latest animated film from DreamWorks and director Chris Sanders, who brought us Lilo and Stitch. And this is also a very family-friendly, heartwarming tale much like Lilo and Stitch, but it's a robot and animals. This film is so freaking amazing. It's so well made. The animation is absolutely gorgeous. And I want to say the experience of seeing this film in the theater, I want to give a shout out right now because I had the the uh, pleasure of being able to see this film at the AMC Theater here in town that has a new special projector. I believe it's called the HDR projector. And it does this really cool thing where it balances light that's being projected onto the screen and so this film was specifically made for that type of camera and believe me it I mean I don't know I haven't compared it to anything normal yet though so I have maybe I need to go see this in like a regular movie theater but after seeing it on that new camera or projector and on the big prime screen with this th sound system and all that man this movie was amazing. This is definitely a see it on the big screen. It's just visual eye candy and the story is amazing. It gets you in the feels. So it tells a story of this robot that crash lands on an island and befriends the animals that are there. This is a story of parenting, of community, all those fun, warm and fuzzy feelings that just build together and absolutely perfect family film and I earlier this year was saying that in you know inside out 2 was probably going to be the big winner of everything this year but I don't know man because wild robot is definitely going to give that movie a run for its money come award season all right so that brings me to number three and we're going to get back into the spooky scary folks now this is a movie that I personally really really enjoyed and I completely understand a lot of the criticism of this film and a lot of people who are saying that it was you know not exactly what they were expecting and I completely agree that's okay well that's great but when it comes to something like film or art in general the thing we have to remember is that there's a lot of sub it's, it's subjective right I'm gonna like something you're not generally gonna like it and that is a okay and the reason I really enjoyed this movie was its story felt very personal to me and I identified a lot with the characters in the film and you know even if it's not a perfect movie when those elements line up it is a perfect movie to you. So my number three is The Shade. We're going to put that right there, number three. Now, The Shade tells the story of three brothers. One brother who's off at college, and he comes back home to his two other brothers who are still living at home. Now, the, sec the middle brother, I do believe he's more of our main character, and he's the one we follow throughout the story, but all three brothers are having the same issue, and that is when there's times of anxiety, depression, stress, or something like that, this weird, pale woman will appear to them and seem to stalk them and influence them, their mind and their you know feelings and emotions. This film really meant a lot to me. I really understood the allegory of mental health that was going on here. Generational trauma, generational mental health. You know, there's a lot of things in this film that was very, it felt very personal to myself. I'm not going to get into it because that's private shit and I don't want to talk about it on the old YouTube channel because this is fun and uplifting and all. But I do totally understand where this was coming from. 
I got its deeper core and I connected with this film. So maybe you don't connect with this film on the same level because you were expecting a creature feature monster movie with this pale demon creature woman stalking and the film ended up being about something else. And that's cool. I get it. But I loved it. I thought this film was excellent. Um, it tell, Like I said, it tells the story of these three brothers who are being stalked by this pale woman in, in times of trouble. And I thought there was some excellent, excellent, excellent you know, cinematography in this film. I liked the storytelling, the way everything unfolded. There were things about this film that I really liked that worked very well with more of an allegory, metaphor-styled horror film. Like, for instance, at no given time does anybody else in the movie ever see this pale woman. It's definitely between the three brothers. It d gives good hints that allows you to know that, again, it only shows up at times of stress to influence them into doing something terrible. And in my opinion, I think it ends on a nice, you know, very positive ending if you interpret it that way. I could definitely see where some others wouldn't, but I do look at it in a very positive light. So... In all honesty, guys, uh, if you can find this movie streaming near you, it wasn't released in a lot of theaters, and if you are somebody that uh, kind of understands the message of what I'm talking about here, I think you might find something here. Otherwise, I honestly, I don't know, to be personally, perfectly honest, because like I said, this is a very slow movie, slow burn style horror film with not a lot of scares, very creepy elements. There are some moments of very creepy vibes, but the movie never really goes into full-blown horror movie territory it stays right in that more thriller kind of maybe you know more of an occulty thriller kind of vibe but it doesn't really go into full-blown here we are trying to scare you kind of horror film it mostly is there to deliver its message and tell its story so let's move on to number four and number four oh boy you know what this was again this was a this was a fun film uh, for me because I think it did exactly what a documentary should and that is teach you something about somebody new that you don't know anything about and that is my number four choice <laughs> make me Famous. Make Me Famous tells the story of artist Edward Brzezinski and uh, the movement of art that was happening in the East Village of New York City in the early 80s. It was a really cool, you know, modern art scene that was going on in that time period. I was hit up and asked to check this film out. It's going around to different, um, I believe it's different art museums right now, currently throughout the country doing like a film festival type thing. And so we got it here in Kansas City and I was asked to check the film out. I really enjoyed it. I thought it really delivered what you want in a documentary. I had no idea about this art movement. I didn't know anything about the artists that they talk about. And by the end of it, I had a new appreciation for this art movement, for the artist that was part of it. And I really enjoyed that the way the whole film, the whole thing flowed. It was just, you know, again, a very normal type of documentary where you talk to other artists that were in that time period in that movement, but I really liked learning something completely new that was happening during a time I was alive, but I didn't know was happening because I was, I was kind of young in 1980. I was five. So <laughs> I didn't know this was happening and now I do. And that's cool. So it finds itself at number four. So number five, oh boy, now we're getting out. I want to say, even though some of these movies, these movies I'm ranking, they may not be one, two, three, whatever, but these are still solid, watchable films. Let me put it to you that way, okay? This is just on my enjoyment level, all right? So next up, I'm going with Azrael. Azrael. Ooh boy. Now this one might still be in theaters in your area, but it is coming to Shudder also. This is a Shudder original starring Samara Weaving, and it tells the story of a world that has been raptured. And you are told this right out the gate, so it is yes, it is a religious horror film, but it tells it in kind of a different way, right? Because these are all the people who are left behind on the earth. And so there's a group, this uh, tribe of people that are trying to appease the Lord and so on and so forth. So they don't talk. They, they gave up their ability to communicate with each other. So this film has zero dialogue, or I should say zero understandable dialogue. There is a point where someone speaks, but it's complete and total gibberish because of course, 
this person played by Samara Weaving doesn't understand anything because they don't know language. But anyways, anyways. So in this world, Samara Weaving plays a woman who is to be a sacrifice to these creatures that live outside the gates of her tribe. And this film could be told in like three different aspects it's like a survival horror because at first she's like trying to get away from this tribe and they catch her and then they they put her out there as the the sacrifice and she gets away and she runs off away from the tribe well then she decides that she's going to get revenge so she goes back to the tribe to kill everybody off inside this tribe of people so it kind of gets a little on the frustrating side because you're like would you just run away just get away from these people get out of there oh my god but at the same time without any dialogue this film tells a really interesting story and it flows along at a really great pace it doesn't really slow down it doesn't bore you there are some moments of just like where she has to actually stop running for a second and catch her breath like the character must stop running but other than that this movie just goes balls to the wall lots of great special effects practical horror special effects very real realistic type of stuff not like you know over the top i mean over the top as in like yeah that's probably what it looks like to have someone's head completely ripped off their body by something but not like you know i guess you could say samurai film blood squirting out the side of their freaking neck kind of uh, gore this movie kind of plays it in the the realistic gore area and it knocks it out of the ballpark the creature design i really liked they were like this weird burnt human zombie tar monster thing so this film is just an all-around solid horror movie that i believe is coming to shutter next month so if this sounds like something you would be interested in definitely check this one out if it's not still in theaters in your area all right so next up number six hmm number six we're gonna go with demon disorder now, The Demon Disorder is another kind of allegory horror movie. It tells the story of these three brothers that at, uh, they, they get back together after their father's death. Now, during the time that they're leading up to their father's death, a lot of crazy weird stuff happened. Their father died, and now the brothers come back together because those weird events are happening again. Now, this is, again, like I was saying, it is an allegory horror movie. It does try to tell the story of, um, I want to say it's also uh, trauma, mental, you know, mental, mental health and things of that sort. But unfortunately, the film doesn't do a really good job of locking down what the allegory actually is. But the reason why I like this movie a lot doesn't have to do with the story really at all. It has to do with the effect effects of this film. This movie's special effects for being 100% practical were ridiculously good. And this is also like transformation horror, which I really, really enjoy. Not really body horror, but like the transformation horror that was in like American Werewolf in London, where it really looks like someone's going through all of that. This film has moments just like that film of this demon disorder that's manifesting inside them and things of that sort. Lots of really, really good gore in this film. Lots of great stuff, but it just didn't deliver Deliver its message is solid, but it does deliver a pretty good, fun monster flick if that's what you're in the mood for. But if you're looking for something with a little bit deeper story, with a little bit more meaning to it, maybe watch The Shade. But in this case, if you want a nice blood fest with some amazing special effects, definitely check out The Demon Disorder. All right, number seven coming up here. Uh, you know, I'm going to go with it. Here we go. Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. Whoop. Here we go. Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. Now, I did enjoy this movie. I did like this movie. And I did give it a solid get out there and see it in theaters. But if I had to rank it, yeah, this is where it falls. I didn't think it was absolutely perfect, but I did have fun with it. I thought the story was pretty good. They pieced together enough stuff to keep it entertaining, even though it didn't really all fit together. Because that was one of the things that really bothered me was it didn't really feel like a, co like a cohesive movie. It felt like the Beetlejuice comedy hour, right? It was like a Saturday Night Live 
episode that had somewhat of a theme running throughout it. Yeah, something like, was it like Mad TV? Didn't Mad TV or like Monty Python's Flying Circus would have like a theme throughout the episode and so all of the different sketches had something to do with that. And that's exactly what Beetlejuice Beetlejuice felt like. But because of the outstanding performances, mostly from Catherine O'Hara and Michael Keaton, this film's comedy does land. The jokes are amazing. And just seeing Michael Keaton slide back into the role after all these years and take it so seriously and knocking out of the ballpark, bringing in some actual legitimate laughs into the film, I really liked it. I loved the film's design. I mean, they could have done a cop-out and just used CGI, but they used a lot of practical effects in this film. There was CGI that was used, but the CGI that was used was still very good. And then tying in extremely well done, solid practical effects, much like the first Beetlejuice movie, and it really felt like it fit right in that universe. So even though it's one of those 30 plus year legacy sequels, it does a really good job fitting into it cohesively and it doesn't look too shiny and new, which is something that always drives me nuts with movies like this, but it does a pretty good job. All in all, it was a solid watch. I think it's definitely going to be added to the list of Halloween movies that I'll probably watch every so often. At a, you know, like, I'll forget, and, like, five years later, be like, oh, Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. Yeah, I forgot about that. Let's watch it again. And then I'll watch it and be like, oh, yeah, that's why I kind of forgot about that movie. It's, it's fun. It's fun. But just, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's just one of those movies. All right. So that brings us to number eight. We're coming down to the final three. Now, this movie is not at number eight because it's a bad film. This movie's at number eight because it just, it was it was a very, 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 very good movie, but in like my personal feelings, my personal, like if I'm gonna sit down to watch a movie, this is not a movie I'm going to choose to sit down and watch because it's some heavy subject matter, and that is His Three Daughters. Like I said, it's not because it's poor or poorly made or a bad movie whatsoever. I'm going to take a quick breather here and have a, have a drink. Hold on. Ah. So anyways, yeah, it's not that it's a bad movie at all. This is an excellent film. It's a very well-made movie. The story is extremely well done, and the acting between the three main actresses, uh, is outstanding they have some great chemistry together that really bring together the idea of them being sisters the story is just it's hard it's about the end of the life of their father and the different emotions that they're going through and each of the sisters of course are dealing with the loss of their father you know who is dying in the room you know and next to them basically dealing with this in their own separate ways and each one of the daughters know their father in a kind of a different way they're from um, different mothers in some cases well, one of the daughters is more of a stepdaughter but was completely raised by the man at a very very early age and knows nothing about her biological father so yes this man was her father and then the youngest was the daughter that was between his second wife and you know the oldest daughter and so on and so forth yeah you know good old-fashioned confusing family trees like that so yeah the film is some really really great storytelling outstanding award-winning kind of acting it's just yeah i'm not going to choose to sit down and watch this movie for fun let's just put it that way i'm not going to be like hey like, oh, no, let's let's pull the old criterion edition of uh, his three daughters out and have a good old laugh here huh okay <laughs> that's not that kind of movie but still an absolutely amazing film Ex outstanding performances all around and of everybody in this movie if you are a netflix subscriber definitely check this movie out definitely watch it don't be thrown off by the fact that i'm talking about how just emotional of a film it is go down that road because that's what makes these movies so freaking good is when they can pull those emotions out of you so let this movie do it because it does a great job okay that brings us to oh, our last two and these are always where i reveal my least favorite of course all right, so out of the two movies at the end, we have The Front Room and Apartment 7A. And I think both of these movies kind of suffer from some of the some similar issues uh, because I feel like one of these films doesn't go hard enough whatsoever in the topics that it could go into, and then the other movie is just pointless and doesn't need to exist. So the first one, number nine, is going to The Front Room. 
Now, there was some really, really good stuff in this film, and that's why it's not my least favorite film of the year or the month, because Brandy and especially Katherine Hunter do outstanding jobs in this movie. Now, Brandy's performance is a little subtle. It starts off, it just kind of seems like she's overwhelmed and she's just at her breaking point. And as the film progresses, she just starts to kind of lose it, but in a very like behind the eyes kind of way. Like you can tell that craziness is going on behind Brandy's eyes, but she's not getting it out there. And then Catherine Hunter is just unhinged as this crazy overbearing stepmother-in-law. And boy, oh boy. I mean, this is one of those movies that is definitely a solid watch when it hits the old streaming services but the movie was set out it was advertised as a horror film i put this movie more in the dark comedy category there's actually a lot more laughs in this film than there are scares i never felt legitimate dread throughout the entire movie more of like an annoyance so anyways this movie tells the story of a young couple who are about to have a baby and wouldn't you know it the stepmother of the husband her or his father his father the husband's father dies and then the stepmother makes a deal with the two yet the younger couple that if she comes to live with them they can get a whole bunch of money they'll get in the will they get all this money and she's near the end of her life anyway so how long is it gonna take i mean that's pretty much what she says to him anyways so then this old bag makes their life hell and there are moments where this film could dive into a lot of deeper stuff. And if they would have, it would have probably put it up higher on the list. You know, there's issues with stuff like biracial relationships and, you know, other things that could dive deeper. Motherhood, modern motherhood, what it means to be a woman in today's society. These are all things that are touched on in this film, but it never quite, you know, it never quite lands on anything. It never quite gets in there and grabs onto it but what it really did deliver was the laughs i mean in all honesty there is some legitimately funny moments in this film so you know if it pops up on a streaming service it's an a24 movie and i think they do hbo max max whatever it's called anyways check it out if it comes out but i don't think this was necessarily a see it in theaters movie and i don't think i'm going to be looking for the criterion edition for this one either so that becomes number 10 the least favorite of the month and this was a movie that i don't even know why they made it Apartment 7A. So, what is Apartment 7A, you might ask? Well, it is the prequel to Rosemary's Baby. And you're probably sitting there wondering, why did they make a prequel to Rosemary's Baby? And, well, watch 7A and find out, because this movie is legitimately pointless. It's not a terrible movie, but it suffers from every single problem I ever talk about when it comes to prequels. There's no tension in the film. You already know what's going to happen to the character. It's just the events that lead up to it, which really don't matter in the grand scheme of things. Now, the movie did deliver on a lot of actions. Aspects. There is some really outstanding cinematography. The film isn't doing any harm to Rosemary's Baby. Let's put it that way. If it's one thing I could say about this film that's nice is it doesn't take away whatsoever from the original film's legitimacy. It, it's just there. It just exists. Much like the 1976 made-for-TV movie, Whatever Happened to Rosemary's Baby. It's in the ether. It exists. But that's it. <laughs> that's it. No one knows. No one cares. And that's what this movie is. And unfortunately, I feel bad because there are some really good elements here. There's some good performances. The film itself is very well made. It very it keeps with the vibe of that time period. The film is set in 1965 and the setting and everything looks outstanding. There's a lot of hard work and dedication and blood, sweat and tears that went into the costuming, the set design all of that to really take you back to 1965 and it's just so sad that it ended up being such a absolutely pointless movie for its existence in all honesty but it does deliver in some categories and to be perfectly honest if you are a subscriber of paramount plus 
I'm not saying go out and get a subscription to Paramount Plus. Maybe do the, you know, the freebie test. Yeah, give it a week. Make sure you set a reminder in your phone. You know how it's done. But anyways, if you're a subscriber to Paramount Plus, you got nothing better to do. Eh, give it a watch. Give it a view. Check it out. It exists. And you'll go, yeah, yeah, that was, that was a movie. That was, that was about it. Well, okay, all right, guys, there we go. You have it. Now, like I said, the month of September did deliver some very good, excellent films. This does not necessarily dictate the quality of these films. This is just in the order of how I feel about them and how much they joy, I guess you could say, entertainment, knowledge, whatever was brought to me personally. So your list is probably a heck of a lot different than mine. So down in the comments, go ahead, let me know what your top 10 favorite films of September 2024. And anyways, guys, that brings us to the end of another Film Geek video. Thanks again for watching. If you liked what you saw here today, go ahead and subscribe to the channel, ring that bell for notifications, and give me the old thumbs up so I know you like what you're seeing. And if there's one more thing you can do, folks, that is keep watching movies. You know I'm gonna. <laughs>